take it away, Tricia. We're ready with the recording. Oh, thank you. So I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I want now I'm an art teacher, elementary art teacher. So my perspective is going to look pretty different from the other two speakers that you had today. I hopefully will inspire you to put art in your makerspace and make art a prominent part of what you're doing. So I have a list of something like 152 STEAM lessons, and it's a growing list. That's um, one of those links on the side, the some more one would lead you there. And so everything I'm gonna share today comes from that list where all the resources and student examples and um, well, pretty much anything you would need to know for how we put that project together are listed there. So we're gonna start with a poll question. See if we can get that started. And the poll question is going to ask, what kind of maker are you? So I didn't invent these categories. This is something that I saw online when I was searching around for maker questions. And so I thought it was important to ask yourself what your maker style is. Maybe it's your learning style. Maybe it's your discovery style. And when I asked myself, what my answer would be, I came up with a self-learner. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure I dabble in the other areas too, but a self-learner is, I would say that because I'm very hands-on and concrete in what I do, which, which is perfect for being with elementary kids. They're very, oh, I'm sorry, this is loud. Do you hear my jingling? I'll stop. Um, so they're very concrete about how they learn. And because I am too, I think we work side by side really well. So I see um, do-it-yourselfers. I see people who aren't sure, it looks like, right? OK, so let's go on and take a look at the first thing I want to share with you, see if I can get my slides to work here. Okay. We're going to look at Light Up Robots, which I'm extremely excited about. I wrote a grant through actually DonorsChoose.org for supplies to do Light Up Robots with my fifth grade students. And the art side of it is I wanted to teach them how to make a robot that looks like it's three-dimensional. So we would work on turning shapes into forms. And then when we paint, we would use um, shades and tints and perhaps um, maybe do some blending to try to show that something is three-dimensional through paint. But I was introduced to the idea of paper circuits um, when I was at an ed camp and at an art conference. And when I was introduced to them, they were shown to me as um, these circuits where there's an LED, a battery, and the circuit is created through copper wire or adhesive, copper adhesive tape. And the circuit was completely showing. And then they would take the corner of the paper and fold it over the battery and say, now look at this object I happened to draw on the same paper lights up. And I thought, that's super cool. But as an art teacher, I don't want just some object sitting next to a circuit to light up. I want it to be an art, like I want the science to be embedded in the art. I really want there to be a balance between the art and the science, which is very real world. Um, that's how products become beautiful to us. So I came up with this design to try out with my students, where we do the circuit on the back of the robot. We pick one place for one LED to light up. And then we integrate the button that closes the circuit into the design of the robot. So here is another um, design. This would light up two eyes. And you can see from the back that the circuit is um, connected. Well, I guess maybe you can't see there. Now you can see how it's connected. Do you see how that flap has a little bit of copper tape on it? That tape came from the back, and then when you close that button, 
over, sort of like a flap over the battery, the circuit is closed and the lights would go on. So the button looks like part of a robot, the lights are part of the robot, and it's all integrated, and the messy stuff is on the back, where it should be. I played with some other ideas because making that button and the flap seemed pretty, I don't know, we'll see how the kids handle that because we're in the process of working on that now. And these were ideas that I played with before I started with the students. But I, I did something with, um, well, I bought some momentary buttons. I was trying some different kinds of ways to close the circuit ahead of time so that we don't have to rely on a flap to close the circuit. Instead, the circuit is already closed through that button. How it works is when you actually press the button, the LED would light up because that closes. Well, I guess I didn't explain that right. <laughs> we build the circuit and we don't have to touch it anymore. And when we press the button, the circuit is closed and the electricity gets to the LED. And it also makes a really cool sound. So that's worth it. And that idea um, would have worked if the buttons didn't show up like a, they were like a, a, like maybe a fourth of an inch, a quarter of an inch, um, and they were just so tiny. I thought we'd have to work with tweezers. So since then, and I don't have a picture, we came up with these rocker buttons. They're called rocker switches, and they go on and off, and that's the way to go. They cost a little bit more, but maybe only 10 cents per button. And I think your budgets probably are better able to afford that than mine. I would have to write a grant, but seriously worth it because then you don't accidentally leave the circuit closed and run out your battery, which is what I do all the time. Okay, our next idea. Um, this is a, these are paintings by my fourth graders. The assignment was to show movement in their painting. So they um, did action poses, and movement was shown through the bending of elbows and knees and the angles and the vibrant colors and the patterns. And um, all that working together with color balance created movement. But I was thinking as they were working, you can see them working, about how we can take this to a different level and have them show movement in a more dynamic way. So as they're finishing up their project, I wrote another grant to create green screen stop motion stations. And my idea was for them to do stop motion animation over a green background. And the green background would allow them with a green screen app, which I'll explain in another slide, to erase the green and layer it over a digital image of their finished painting. So these are our green screen stop motion animation stations. We have six of them in the room. And so they worked collaboratively together on making tiny little movies. They were only two seconds long each, and they each had a role in their group. Um, two were animators, one was the photographer, and one was the director. If you were the director, it was your movie that they were making, and then when your movie was done, which was about 30 frames, that's all we needed, it's 30 frames of movement. So if you don't know stop motion, it's move the mannequin, take a picture, move the mannequin, take a picture, move the mannequin, take a picture. So we used an app called iMotion HD on our iPads, which was free, and it collects all the images, turns it into a video, and saves it to the camera roll. So simple. <laughs> and I'm old enough to know that it wasn't that easy <laughs> just a couple of years ago when I tried it. So um, they were making their tiny little movies, and then after all four movies in their group were done, we imported their tiny little movie into the green screen app by Do Ink over a digital picture of their finished painting. And the green screen app does it immediately. They erase, erase, 
erases the green for you according to the setting and you can tweak it a little bit and then you export it into a movie. And then they turned in all their movies and we created one class movie and set it to music. So they were able, the, I mean, the bottom line is, they were able to demonstrate movement over a painting of movement. So it transformed this particular project and actually introduced uh, a new dynamic way for them to demonstrate their understanding. Okay, and the, um, oh, I forgot to say, we're going to talk about three ideas specifically, and then we're going to do speed round with a whole bunch of little ideas that aren't little. I mean, just touch on them little. Okay, so Lego Mural is next. So I also wrote a grant for, um, did you notice there's a pattern? I have to write grants for everything. So anyway, I wrote a Lego Mural grant for um, an idea that was inspired by the librarian in my area um, at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. Are you here? Maybe you are. But um, anyway, so he had this idea to do a Lego mural before I'd ever heard of such a thing. And his idea was a little different than mine, but once it started my mind going, I thought, well, you know what? Legos can be a media for just another medium for creating art. And I should start thinking about it differently. So um, after we received the grant for Lego murals, it, it was the idea is that this is a reusable space that the kids are going to build on base plates of 10 by 10. And I don't know if you can see in this picture, but like, for example, Barack Obama is made out of six 10 by 10 base plates. And so is everybody else. So we approached it, since I have six tables in my room, we approached it one portrait at a time, and every table had one piece of the big puzzle to work on, which I think you can see. Well, I guess this is the app that we use to put it together. We use the Photo Brick app to start to turn our photos into photo mosaics that would help us break it down into um, photo brick looking pieces. And then there was another website that helped me print it out so that it actually was a one-to-one -one, um, for my students, which meant that all they had to do was count bricks and match bricks. And literally, it was 32 bricks across, 32 bricks down on each plate. And so if you saw those sheets of paper, they were 32, 32, and so they just matched. And it wasn't a creativity project, it was a thinking project, a collaborative project, and also at the same time, we were learning about each figure from Black history as we were building the murals. So here's the students working together, and maybe you'll be able to see that they are looking also at an iPad that shows them the big picture while they're working on their tiny piece, which I think is an important lesson for students just to get a feel for how their part can be a part of a big picture, I mean, literally in this case, and they need to be accurate. You know, it really matters that they get their part correct because when we put it all together, it'll um, make a stronger image at the end. And a lot of kids had to go back and redo their work because they weren't counting, they were guessing, they were estimating, and then it didn't match up. So precision and counting became part of it. It was very much a math side of their brain working. This, um, we had another idea. Actually, this is the first idea, the Black History Month I idea was the second idea. The very first idea we did with the Lego wall was rotational symmetry. So rotational symmetry I thought would be really easy. I thought, oh, yeah, you know. You put in the brick and then you spin it. Put in the brick and spin it. But um, it wasn't because at like a pinwheel, it, it wasn't the symmetry they expected and they were very confused by it. So we turned it into a game. And so do you see that piece of cardboard there that masked out three quarters of the plate? That helped them understand that whatever goes in that one quarter 
needs to be the same as every other quarter so they can mask out, then spin the plate and see if they've matched in all four corners. So they spin the plate and match it. So the game that we turned it into was um, each of the students would get four matching bricks, any size, any color, but have four of them. And then when they pick their four, they pass it out to their partners. And then whoever goes first places their brick anywhere they want within that quadrant. And then you spin the plate and get the new quadrant to show. And the next person has to match the brick. Then spin and match, spin and match. And it worked. First graders were doing it, and fifth graders were doing it. And everybody loved it. And everybody was getting really successful rotational symmetry. So, thrilled. <laughs> and that's why I wrote it up for School Arts Magazine. Okay, we're going to do another poll question. And then we'll go into our speed round. This poll question is going to ask you about what obstacles do you face in building a makerspace? Because I know that's what you're aiming towards, right? So just kind of curious what's going on with your makerspaces. I know that that's one of the things they're working on for the library in my building. We're working on writing a grant to get one. In funds, yeah, like I said, we're writing a grant to get one because they will be expensive, especially if you're buying things like the little bits and um, or if you're going to do the big time things because we just heard about uh, with uh, the laser cutter and the 3D printer. You can, yeah, it's not like our, the little things that I'm talking about. Okay, so there's time issues and there's money issues. There isn't an interest issue, and that's good to know. All right, so we're going to go into my speed round now. And with seven minutes left, if I'm looking at the clock right. So my rapid fire round is coming, and I'm just going to throw a bunch of ideas out really quickly. And then you're going to just ask me questions, okay? So I'm going to talk about translational tessellations first. Now this is a traditional lesson that I did with students where we make translational tessellations out of construction paper. Once they learn the concept, then we turn it into a creativity challenge by having them try to draw an image on their tessellation in the style of like MC Escher. But once we understood the concept, and this is a tiny little diagram that explains the concept, but it's really supposed to be an animation, so it doesn't extremely, you know, it's, it's missing a couple pieces of the steps. But we use a Maziograph app to do digital translational tessellations. The app isn't exactly set up for it, but we were able to hack it a little bit, and I do have a tutorial video on my website that shows you how. And the students really loved it because you draw one translational, do one little puzzle piece, and then color that one puzzle piece. And this is all on your iPad. And everything is colored. So they're able to transfer their understanding of tessellations, translational tessellations, digitally, and also you know, enjoy the benefits of doing digital work and having that kind of precision and repetition built in for them. Kindergarten snowmen. Now, kindergartners, and I'm experiencing this now, can barely do anything at the beginning of the year. And a lot of times you put an iPad in their hands and they are good at being a consumer, but not necessarily good at being a creator on an iPad. So I try to do my first steps with them and keep it very simple. So we make a three-dimensional snowman and learn the concept of small, medium, and large and the accessories and how to attach them to make a snowman. And then we try to do it digitally, but I actually give them a template. Though that sounds easy, it's not <laughs> because they have to import their template into the drawing app, which we used in this case brushes because it has such a simple interface. And then they have to create a layer over it to where they do all their drawing. 
And that's when they can transfer their understanding of snowmen. But now they have to think two-dimensionally instead of three-dimensionally. So it challenges that kind of thinking while having a successful first try at digital art creation. Here's the next one, Lima Bean Monsters. I love Lima Bean Monsters. There's a wonderful tumble book, which I'm probably, you know already about the Lima Bean Monster because it is based on a book. And so I played it for my first graders, and it's a very simple project that we're doing here, mostly just learning about shape and, you know, lines connect to make shapes. And then we're thinking about monsters in terms of, um, you know, the monster that attacks you when you don't eat your vegetables. So on that theme of healthy eating, I had the students pose as if they were their own lima bean monster. They got monster claws that I bought at the party store, um, a plastic vegetable of their choice. And then they turned themselves into, oh, no, that picture didn't show up. Aw, it was really cute. It was a lamb, they turned themselves into their own, um, you know what, since it's not there, I wonder if I could just hold up my iPad and show you through my webcam. Can you see that? Hmm? Can you see? Eat your veggies. They turn themselves into their own um, healthy eating poster. Okay. Sorry, that slide didn't show up. Then we made a digital ebook of their lima bean monsters. We collaged all their monsters together until every monster was represented. We used the book creator app and added their lima bean monster voice to their, <laughs> the pages of the book. Then I actually taught the first graders how to download the ebook from my website onto an iPad. Those scrolls of paper are their directions for how they can do that from home. So they could go home with their family and if they have an iPad at home, they could go through the steps of downloading the ebook and listen to the book. Um, with their family, but we spent some time in art class listening to the book that they created. And then there's spooky landscapes. I know I'm running out of time, but this is so cool. I was doing landscapes with students where they would show a ghost in the foreground, a house in the middle ground, and spooky sky, the moon, and the bat in the background. And we were looking at secondary colors and all these other landscape concepts. But I thought it would be more spooky if we can do an, I know this is an animation and you can't see it, but they did a transparent um, ghost flying across a digital image of their paintings. So students worked together. Um, well, they made a two-frame animation in the Do Ink animation app of a ghost that moved. And then that ghost that moved would then fly across their paintings after they finished it. So they took a digital picture of their painting, and then I wish you can see how cute these are, and you can when you look at um, the links. And they um, had these flying ghosts. Now, not only did that show foreground, it showed and overlapping, which was the original concept, or concept that I wanted them to demonstrate. But they also had a chance to learn animation and transparency. So I thought that transformed the lesson. And then we used the green screen app, which we used earlier in that movement over movement project. And we had them get up in front of the camera and talk about why their spooky landscape was spooky. And the ghost was animating in the background as they spoke. All right, I am running out of time. so. There's lots more. There's really cool flying bugs. <laughs> then there's weird photo app and monochromatic tricks and really cool things. And now you can ask me questions before you have to go. Sorry. <laughs> Trisha, that was so, so wonderful. And uh, people will be able to see more on, on your blog and in follow up with you on Twitter. So um, but let's get in a couple of questions before time runs out. So one was, uh, Kelly, Kelly wondered, do you offer professional development for art teachers? Like, have you ever thought about doing that? 
I've done that too. Yes, I'm gonna. Yeah, I do that all the time. Ah, so, so should people reach out to you if they're interested? Yeah. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Um, and then how much time do you get with your art students? And is it once or twice a week or more or less? Once a week, 45 minutes. Kindergarten needs 30 minutes once a week. So we have to pack in a lot and a little bit of time. So for the projects that we saw, you, you would have built on those over many weeks and months in some cases? In some cases, yes. We don't have a lot of quantity, but we try to have projects that are full of depth and you can learn a lot of concepts within it. Excellent. And do you have any suggestions for doing some of these projects if people don't have access to iPads? I have some um, versions of these projects like the Lima Bean Monster Eat Your Veggie project. I have the iPad version and I also have a desktop version and I have those tutorials linked to on my some more page. So that there's many cases where that I had multiple ways of doing the projects and I shared that through tutorials. Excellent. Well, Tricia, thank you so much for such a helpful session. And I hope everyone is grabbing um, all of Tricia's contact information where you can follow up for more information. And we will, of course, post the slides and uh, the chat transcript within the online classroom. Tricia, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care.